to end on the shores of Cardigan Bay, where the beaches were long and the countryside as beautiful as anywhere in the British Isles. This film will take us there in the early 60s to see the delights of the steam railway, where the sounds of the sea and bird song mingled with the measured beat of the steam locomotive. We travel there on the route of the Cambrian Coast Express to arrive at Aberystwyth, famed for its usually immaculate manor class 460s. The town could be reached by the Carmarthen line as well as from Shrewsbury. In 1962, GWR moguls still had some duties along the coastline, but the standard classes, notably class 4460s, were beginning to make inroads on the allocations of the steam sheds still existing and would see out the end of steam here in 1967. Our journey along the coast will be punctuated by visits to other steam railways which are still with us today but greatly changed in infrastructure and routing in some cases such as the Vale of Rydal which once had its own terminus by the harbour at Aberystwyth. The Talliflin had led the steam railway preservation movement to what we know it today and in 1962 was even experimenting with the latest steam engine development like the Giesel ejector. The Festiniog was not far behind in opening its line and by 1958 had reached Tannibook and the railway's unique double fairly locomotives could once more be seen in action. They even had the services of top link driver Bill Hall. Spending a 1960s holiday in North Wales, one might also have caught a glimpse of other narrow gauge locomotives in the slate quarries. All this and the standard gauge we will now recall. Paddington Station in London was where the Cambrian Coast Express departed for its eight-hour, ten-minute journey for the 271 and a half miles to Pothelli. The motive power for the start of the journey would be a Castle or a King-class locomotive. 4089 Donington Castle was built in July 1925 and for a long period was shedded at Old Oak Common. Kings, when used, worked to Wolverhampton and not until the latter days of the Express did they go through to Shrewsbury. The most famous of them all was King George V, here proudly displaying the bell presented on its visit to the Baltimore and Ohio Railway in 1927. The normal route of the Cambrian Coast Express was via the new line of 1910 via High Wycombe and Bicester, avoiding Reading and Oxford. We pause at Ivor on the latter route, where a down express passes Castle Hall. Ivor, at 15 miles from Paddington, was on dead level track created by Isambard Kingdom Brunel for the Great Western Railway in 1838. The early 60s saw the running of the Blue Pullman sets on the western region between Paddington and Bristol and South Wales. Reading Shed was typical of the GWR sheds along the route. Oakley Hall, for so long an old oak engine, was now in 1962 shedded here and is approaching the turntable at the west end of this nine road shed. Twenty eight fifty six was being serviced after working in from Oxley Depot. Two years later, she would be cut up at Bird Scrapyard at Risca. Twenty two sixty one is also of Reading Shed and is typical of the class which we will see on the Cambrian system. Shrewsbury was 153 miles from Paddington via High Wycombe and could be reached by the Cambrian Coast Express in three and a half hours. The castle, usually hauling the train, would retire to Colham Shed for servicing. Reliving these days, we see Clun Castle on the shed during 1966, still in its BR livery after working in on an enthusiast special.
Shrewsbury Shed was a joint LMS and GWR operation up to 1948. It was a busy place, with engines coming off routes north, south, east and west, and in 1963 had an allocation of 87 engines, from castles through Jubilees and Black Hives to pannier tanks. Laterally, it was the home to standard class fours, living in a typically smoky atmosphere of a steam shed. These views were taken in 1967, at the end of steam here, with two notable engines present, 75029, which would eventually see preservation as the Green Knight at the East Somerset Railway, and 75033, which worked the last steam hauled up Cambrian Coast Express on March the 4th, 1967. The Cambrian route ran on joint London and North Western and Great Western metals out of Shrewsbury, and alongside the old Shropshire and Montgomery Railway at Mole Brace, the Potts, as it was known, ran through the arch of the bridge to the left of the train. This joint operation continued past Hanwood to Buttington Junction near Welsh Pool, where the Cambrian proper was attained. Thirty-eight miles from Shrewsbury was Moat Lane Junction, where the Mid Wales Railway via Lanidlois to Tallaghlin Junction diverged southwards. The wonderful scenery of Mid Wales forms a backdrop to the Down Cambrian Coast Express hauled by Hook Norton Manor. Passing unusually at Carsus, the length of the train necessitates using the rusty tracks of the head shunt of the loop before it will set back to continue its journey out of the loop and hence the passing of the Cambrian starter at danger. Here, the eight-mile climb to Tullerdig begins, where we find Foxcote Manor arriving with an up service to Oswestry. Over the 693-foot summit, the approach was on a spectacular 1 in 52 gradient. 75024, with express head code, climbs purposefully up the bank. She would be working hard at the end of her days as well, being one of the shaft bankers at the end there in 1967. Pilot engines assisting from the Huntleth would be in the hands of 78,000 standard moguls. Westbound out of Tullerdy Cutting is 7810 Draycott Manor, with 12 on. Quite a load for the Cambrian, over 400 tonnes. At 27, Lydham Manor climbs through the Cambrian's greatest earthworks, the 120-foot deep cutting. By 1964, her external condition had deteriorated from the early 60s. Aberystwyth, at 234 miles from Paddington, saw the arrival of the CCE at 5.10pm. The resort owes its rise in prosperity to the coming of the railway in 1864. Oswestry Street's Compton Manor arrives past the shed in 1962. The manors were tried on the Cambrian in 1943, when Cookham Manor did the honours. After the Second World War, their 22-year reign on the line began, with three at Oswestry and two at Mahunthleth. Draycott Manor, another of Oswestry's allocation, visits Aberyst with Shed in the summer of 1962. Very few panniers were to be seen at this end of the Cambrian system, but 7428 was present on this visit, soon to be withdrawn in October 1962. Aberystwyth Shed was situated in the fork of the Carmarthen and Mahunthleth lines. In 1925, the GWR took out the turntable and constructed a new line between the two, 
forming a triangle and was used for loco turning purposes only. A manner is performing this movement. The Aberystwyth to Carmarthen line survived until December 1964 when flood damage near Strata, Florida prematurely closed the line. 78,007 descends the steep incline into one of the Carmarthen line's bay platforms. The 7803 Barcote Manor is shunting a short freight after arrival from the Humphleth, probably because 7428 was laid up at the shed. Petrol tankers for the ore depot are also manoeuvred, traffic which has only ceased in 1993. The 7803 was one of the first five of its class allocated to the Cambrian in 1947 and would succumb to the cutter's torch at Birds of Bridgend in the summer of 1965. To the south of the shed ran the Vale of Rydal narrow gauge line, always an attraction for visitors. Opened in 1902 to tap the lead mines traffic and timber trade in the Rydal Valley, the line has had mixed fortunes over the years. Since 1932, the line has run with three prairie tanks on a gauge of 1 foot 11 and a half inches. Number 7 has brought the morning train down from Devil's Bridge and has returned to the shed area near the original terminus up to 1925 and the junction where the erstwhile harbour branch, closed in 1924, diverged. Number 7 was one of a pair of engines with number 8, built at Swindon in 1923, after the GWR took over the line by absorbing the Cambrian Railway at the grouping. The two locomotives were the only narrow gauge engines built at Swindon, and they followed the original design of locomotives built by Davies and Metcalfe for the opening of the line in 1902, complete with the usual GWR trimmings of brass and copper. The shed was a two-road building of wood and corrugated iron construction, capable of undercover shelter for all three engines in use. There was a coaling bay, and under the new construction at Aberystwyth by the GWR in 1925, a new water tank was installed. Number 7 was named Owen Glendower in 1956 when BR started to publicise the railway stimulated by the growth in interest in other Welsh narrow gauge lines and with it came a GWR green livery and chocolate and cream paint for the coaches. Number 7 is ready for the afternoon departure and shunts its stock back into the old terminus at Aberystwyth alongside the new mainline station, another improvement for the mainline from the 1925 reconstruction plans. Thank <laughs> you.
The mainline station can be seen in the background as the train departs over Park Avenue and also picks up the single line staff from the flagman controlling road traffic. Railway is 11 and a half miles long. The first four and a half miles to Capel Bangor flat and through Meadowland, following the River Rydal. The next seven miles climbs along the hillside to reach Devil's Bridge at 680 feet above sea level. Devil's Bridge, passengers can explore the delights of the area, just as their Edwardian counterparts did from 1902. Others can watch the run round of the locomotive and its watering. Number 7 and 8 are slightly more powerful than the original number 9. When built at Swindon, the GWR policy of standardisation extended to these small locomotives in the use of the motion and cylinders to the same design as their steam rail motors. Devil's Bridge has a run-round loop and stabling facilities in the old goods yard for the times when two trains are present, where lead and timber were once loaded for transshipment to the harbour. Number 9, Prince of Wales, climbs the 1 in 50 towards Devil's Bridge. This was still the era of coal firing, and the Forestry Commission sign on the left would be heeded, lest one wanted a disaster by fire in this heavily wooded area. Number 9 returns to Aberystwyth near Lambedon, the view dominated by the buildings of the University of Wales. The carriage stock on the V of R consists of 16 bogey coaches, 7 closed and 7 open observation seconds, completed by 2 brake seconds. from the original terminus across Park Avenue was abandoned by 1968 when it was relayed into the disused Carmarthen Bay platforms at the mainline station and past the standard gauge disused shed buildings which were then used for the narrow gauge engines. This operation is still in use today.
it is time to rejoin our journey along the Cambrian coast. 7810 Draycott Manor reverses to the station for a stopper to Shrewsbury. At the station, Hook Norton Manor has charge of the up Cambrian Coast Express and well turned out by Aberystwyth Shed, departs. Stopper is seen near Lambedon, heading for its first stop at Bow Street. The Cambrian was mainly single line and token exchange carried out every few miles. A typical sequence of events for this operation is seen at Bow Street. The signalman loads the apparatus with the token for Borth and waits to pick up the apparist with token dropped by 75016. The signalman returns to his box and we arrive at Dovey Junction. The station had no road access and was an interchange point for passengers journeying to Aberystwyth or stations on the coastline to Patheli. The station area was in three counties, the station master's house in Merioneth and the platforms in Montgomery and the up distant in Cardigan. The station had two platform faces, and a typical movement is seen here when two trains became one in the up direction. 75026 arrives on an up working from Patheli, and uncouples to run into the head shunt. A manner on the up avarice with portion of anything from one to six coaches would reverse onto the train, and depart eastward from the Huntleth, where down trains split for the two destinations. A standard class 4 arrives on a down working, convenient for us to continue north. The line follows the coast with continuous reverse curves, necessitating a 25 miles per hour speed restriction. Four tunnels are traversed before Aberdovey. We emerge from the second, the 219 yard Moor 4 tunnel. Originally, Aber Dovey was to be linked to Aberystwyth across the Dovey Estuary to Inislas and Borth by a bridge similar to the crossing of the Mordach at Barmouth. This proved impractical. Aber Dovey had been reached by rail from the north in 1863. Until the line to Dovey Junction was completed, one could have used the ferry from here to Inislas. In 1958, a GWR 2251 class 060 arrives and departs northward past the Cambrian radio cruise train. This was a daily excursion originating at Landudno and ran via Rill and Corwen to Aberdovey for a two-hour stop, returning via Afon Wen and Bangor. 
Special saloon stock was used and a radio commentary given on the scenic delights of the route. Complete with headboard, 75033 runs round. The first 10 standard 260s of the 78,000 series were sent to the Cambrian brand new in 1952 and 1953. One of them is given the right away by a genuine Cambrian home signal. The harbour branch can be seen diverging to the right. The 78,000s performed pickup freight duties along the coast route as well and visited the branch. At the turn of the century, the Cambrian advertised its deep water pier, for the Waterford and Abba Dubby Shipping Company operated a passenger and freight service to Southern Ireland using the SS Magnetic. The pickup freight reverses its train down the branch, which eventually closed in 1964. It never could have been a serious contender with Holly Head or Fishguard. A GWR mogul leaves Abu Dhabi with a stopping passenger train. Our next call will be Tawid. 75026 has the Potheli portion of the down Cambrian coast at a fair pace. Once the down signal here carried a fixed distant arm for a permanent low speed restriction for token exchange, removed by 1962. The fireman stands by the driver to exchange it. 75021 arrived at Mahunthleth from Oxford in 1962. She stayed until March the next year. All 45 of the 82,262 tanks were built at Swindon between 1952 and 1955. It was not until 1960 the first arrived on the Cambrian at Mahunthleth, and they stayed until 1965, taking over the duties of withdrawn GWR 4500 tanks of the same wheel arrangement. 82032 heads a northbound Class 6 freight into Tawin, finished in unlined green livery a feature of some of the class allocated to the western region. Eight two zero three one was the first of the class to be allocated to Mahunthleth in January 1960. It heads south on a pickup freight, which includes iron-bodied gunpowder vans from Penryn Droidrath Explosives Factory as the fifth and sixth vehicles. Eight two zero three one is again seen on passenger duty, passing under Neptune Road Bridge near Tawin Wharf Station of the Talthin Railway. would become familiar to the southern enthusiasts in 1965 when it was transferred away for its last summer of working at Nine Elms, London. A signal check allows us a view of the wharf at Tawin with narrow gauge tracks alongside coal wagons for transshipment of loco coal.
GWR Mogul 6395 was built 30 years before the 82,000 class tanks. Allocated to Shrewsbury in 1962, she heads south with western and eastern regions stock. The 2251 class 060s replaced Dean Goods from the Cambrian from 1938 onwards. This one is southbound at Towin Wharf. Double chimney 75026, which would end its days on banking duties at Tibay Shed, returns with the up portion of the Cambrian Coast Express. The first of the standard class two moguls, 78,000 herself, was built at Darlington in 1952, but by now had, like the 82,000 tanks, also acquired the western unlined green livery. Behind the train was Tawin Wharf Station of the Talithin Railway. This narrow gauge railway had been running passenger trains since 1866 and passed to a railway preservation society, the first in the world, in 1951. The station has a narrow gauge museum, opened in 1959. Outside for a number of years was Russell from the North Wales Narrow Gauge Railway, later Welsh Highland a Hunslet-built 262 tank of 1906. The railway is of 2 foot 3 inch gauge and runs 7 and a quarter miles to Abergan Nolwen. Today it has been extended to Nant Gwernal, where the slate quarries which the railway was open for existed. The first engine of the railway was number 1, Talithlin, built in 1864 by Fletcher Jennings of Whitehaven and brought by sea to Tawin to help in the construction of the line. She was wore out by 1944 and languished in the works at Pendry. After a sojourn in the hay barn on the north side of the works from 1952, she was sent for overhaul in 1957, returning in 1958. After further modifications, she settled down to useful work. As built, number one was an 04 row, but the ride was atrocious by all accounts. The inspector from the Board of Trade describing it as having excessive vertical oscillation. Two years after she was built, she returned to Whitehaven and was fitted with a pair of wheels under the rear overhang, which cured the problem. If you had visited the railway in 1963, you would have found number two Dolgok, fresh from overhaul. This was the second of the only two engines of the Talithin Railway Company and was built in 1866. The first vehicle in the formation is brake van number five, also built in 1866 and has the guard's lookout on the platform side adapted for selling tickets. The second carriage was built by the Midland Railway Carriage and Wagon Company of Shrewsbury for the Glyn Valley Tramway one of two which came to the railway derelict in the 1950s. In 1951, the railway acquired its first new locomotives for 85 years. 
The 2X Corris Railway locomotives, numbers 3 and 4, were available from storage at Mahunthworth PR Shed for just £25 each. They had been there since 1947 when flooding damaged the line and closed the railway. The railway also obtained a Corris Railway coach, found in use as a garden shed at Gaboen near Oswestry in 1959. It entered service in 1961 as coach number 17. Number four was named Edward Thomas, the general manager of the Talifin Company up to its preservation, built by Kerr Stewart of Stoke in 1921. The Talifin took up Dr. Giesel's offer of a free trial of his invention, the ejector blast pipe and chimney, and fitted it to number four in 1958. When in need of major repair in 1969, it was not replaced. Pendry is the site of the railway's workshops and carriage sheds and the hub of the engineering department. Not much had changed in a hundred years. The station platform and hut were there and the old level crossing gates now replaced. The engine shed constructed of slate blocks from the company's quarry now had a flower bed beneath the wall instead of weeds and the carriage shed had been rebuilt with a steel frame and timber cladding. Number four arrives, passing the new carriage shed on the site of the old hay barn, built between 1959 and 1963. Number one is disposed on the shed, much as it had been done for a hundred years. The fire is cleaned and any clinker removed before moving up for water from the large steel tank on a solid stone column built in society days, replacing the old watering facilities in the shed rafters. Talifin's number five was a petrol engine loco for works trains in 1952, leaving the next available number for a steam engine as number six. This was an Andrew Barclay 040 well tank, arriving on the railway in 1954. Built for the Admiralty in 1918, she had spent most of her life at RAF Culshot on Southampton Water as a two-foot gauge locomotive. Dolgoch was opened in 1873 at a beauty spot for visitors to see the Dolgoch Falls. Engines take water here, supplied from a small dam across a mountain stream and fed down a pipe. Number four departs for Abergenolwyn, a point of interest being that all the railway stock is fitted with side buffers, whereas nearly all Marigate railways only have a single buffer in the centre, incorporating the coupling mechanism. Abergenolwyn was the end of the line in the 1960s, in May 1976, the extension to Nantgwornal was opened. It is time to rejoin the standard gauge at Tawin. A 4300 mogul arrives past the goods shed and cattle dock on the upside, while 6395 departs from a Huntsworth again. The journey north involves a 15 mile per hour restriction down the 1 in 55 at Friog. The sea is 90 feet below us and the site of two accidents in 1883 and 1933 when trains ran into a rock fall and went over the cliff. Consequently, a 60 yard reinforced concrete avalanche shelter was constructed, unique in Britain. At the bottom of the bank is Fairbourne with just one platform and a short siding. 82031 arrives from Barmouth.
Airborne is the home of the then 15-inch gauge railway. It had started life as a two-foot gauge horse-drawn tramway run by Mr McDougall, yes, later of self-raising flower fame, to transport bricks from his works out to the beach for house building. In 1916, in partnership with Bassett Loke, it was regaged to 15 inches and steam worked as a tourist railway to Barmouth Ferry. At Penryn Point, 462 Ernest W. Twinning arrives. Built in 1949 for the Dudley Zoo Railway, it was loaned to the Fairbourne in 1961. It was built by G&S Light Engineering Company of Stourbridge and carries the number 57512 as it did at Dudley Zoo. There was no continuous loop at Penryn Point in the 1960s and the engines would work tender first back to Fairbourne. The engine was shipped to Japan in 1987. The oldest serving loco was the Atlantic Count Louis an improved version of Bassett Lope's Little Giant class. Built in 1924 for Count Louis Zaborowski, the racing driver, it survived until the railway closed as a 15-inch gauge line in 1983 when it was moved to Birmingham. In 1959, a petrol hydraulic loco named Rachel was acquired for peak traffic times. On a lighter note, yes, that was a dog doing second man duties on this highly professionally run miniature railway. Back at the BR station, 7820 Dinmore Manor arrives from Barmouth. Stabled in the siding is a camping coach, a feature here since GWR days, a stipulation for its tenancy being that one must arrive by train, a shrewd move by the railways. The legendary viaduct across the Mordak estuary is just under half a mile long. Open to traffic in 1867, it consists of 113 spans of timber trestle viaduct three hogback lattice girders, including a swing portion standing on steel support cylinders, and a final two spans. The timber section was reconstructed between 1906 and 1909. Baltic wood was used, brought direct by ships to the site. In the 1980s, it was nearly closed for good after being attacked by a species of marine worm. Arriving at Barmouth, the token is given up to the signalman at the south box, which had a 27 lever frame. Barmouth Station has a level crossing in the middle of it. An 82,000 class tank heads south, passing the platform used mainly for trains off the Ruaban line and excursion traffic. The scene is dominated by mountains and a view through to Qatar Idris, nearly 3,000 feet high, as a standard class 4 arrives at Barmouth, viewed from Penryn Point.
from the small beach by the harbour, an 82,000 class approaches Barmouth over the six-span concrete viaduct, which had replaced a former timber structure in 1953. Barmouth was served by trains off the Ruabon, Corwen, Dolgastly line. It was opened throughout in 1869. Local trains were in the hands of pannier tanks, and here a 7400 class crosses the bridge, viewed from Penryn Point. The Dolgastly platform is behind 7405. Built for the GWR trains in Cambrian days, passengers wishing to change trains had to cross the footbridge, or level crossing, there being no physical joining of the platforms. It was, in fact, two stations end on. The Pannier departs on the afternoon train. The line to Ruabon suffered closure under the beaching report of 1963, the last passenger train running on January the 18th, 1965. The slipway, seen as the train begins to cross the bridge, was for Barmouth lifeboat, the only one in Britain to dive under a railway line. A Collet 060 has charge of a coastline train, leaving Barmouth. A standard tank takes the 3.45 p.m. from Bulfelli to Dovey Junction. The first full break carries mail, which will be transferred to the famous 6 p.m. up mail from Aberystwyth at Dovey Junction. Finally at Barmouth, a Manor 460 arrives out of the 75-yard tunnel on a usual four-coach working, stopping at all stations. was 10 miles north of Barmouth, the one place trains could cross between Barmouth and Port Maddock. A standard 262 tank arrives from Pothelli. The view from Harlech Castle shows the straightness of the track northwards, stretching for four miles over Morva Harlech. 82,005 calls at the station with an upworking. The goods yard would close in 1964, and of note is the GWR Pagoda Shelter by the footbridge on the up platform. There were two level crossings here, and the train is seen crossing more of a crossing, controlled by a gatekeeper. At Penryn Diedrath, 6378 is arriving from Barmouth, past Cook's explosive factory, with covered and gunpowder vans visible in its sidings. The tokens are exchanged yet again for the next section to Port Maddock. set off behind a standard mogul up the one in 65 gradient 
treated with great respect by descending goods trains, knowing that there was an explosives factory at the bottom. The line climbs for just over a mile, the gradient easing on the approach to Minford. We pass under the bridge carrying the Festiniog Railway. The station was opened in 1873 as an interchange for the railway. The little signal box had 19 levers, but was not a token exchange point, the token carried on the engine being used to unlock a ground frame in the box if shunting was required. We can stop off here to visit the Festiniog Railway and find Prince standing at the station, preparing to leave with a permanent way train towards Tanibur. In the early 60s, the railway had the services of driver Bill Hall of East Coast Main Line fame. He is seen on the footplate of a fairly, climbing to Tannibal. The railway had closed in 1946, but reopened by volunteers in 1955, four years after the Talaflin. By 1958, services were running to Tanabur. Bill Hall looks round his engine. The society had the use of two double fairlies in the early days, Earl of Merioneth and Merdin Emrys, although both eventually gave trouble and were replaced for a while by engines bought from the Penryn quarries, Linda and Blanche. The fairly patent design dated back to number seven Little Wonder, supplied to the railway in 1869. These were the days when the fairlies were still coal-fired. The fuel can be seen in both bunkers. A feature of these early days at Tannerbulk was the meeting of trains by Betty Jones, who lived in a cottage on the upside of the station. Earl of Merioneth was built in 1885, named Livingstone Thompson, changed to Telesin in 1931. Renamed in 1961, it was the first fairly back in traffic under the Preservation Company. Prince is one of the four original George England built locomotives for the line in 1863. Tanibok has today changed dramatically from these early scenes. Boston Lodge is the shed and works for the railway, situated at the south end of the Cobb. Both Merdin Emrys and Livingston Thompson, later Earl of Merioneth, were built here at the works. Port Maddox Station was built in 1879, replacing an earlier building. The railway had opened in 1836 to carry slate from Blinio Festiniog down by gravity, and the empties returned by horse traction. The last mile into Port Maddock utilised Maddock's 1811 embankment across the Glaslin estuary, and known as the Cobb. The slate industry of North Wales became the birthplace of the proliferation of narrow gauge lines and locomotives. The decline of the slate trade in the early 1960s saw the end of these systems, 
the most notable being that at Dinorwick. Over 20 narrow-gauge locos could be found here working the galleries high on Elidur Mountain. One such was made Marion, Hunslet built in 1903. The sheer enormity of these systems is apparent and Maid Marion joins Bernstein on Shed, renamed in preservation to Jonathan. Point changing on the temporary track was quite literally by hand sometimes and even point switches could be kept lubricated by copious amounts of water. Chain shunting, hand shunting, and even siding access point laying were features seen high on these levels, not often captured on film as Eric Heyman did on a visit in 1959. Although the engines in the quarries were of a standard Hunslet design of 1882, there was the occasional different design to be seen, such as Sybil, built by Bagnalls in 1906, retired in 1963, and presently at Launceston Steam Railway in Cornwall. How's this for the runaway train? Yes, there certainly was a charm on the narrow gauge railways of Wales. This delightful episode was filmed where the Lamberis Lake Railway now has its headquarters, based on the four foot gauge track bed of the Padan Railway. This was a Malfea, a Hunslet of 1886 that once worked the line to Port de Norwich and was scrapped in 1963. But the Cambrian Coast Railway draws us back. Departing Minford, we pass Garth Granite Quarry, known sometimes to supply ballast to the Festiniog Railway, and head for Port Maddock. 78.19, Hinton Manor is arriving from Pulthelly in the latter days of steam on the coastline. It has already lost one nameplate on the driver's side. Incidentally, it is named after an 18th century house overlooking the Upper Thames. In 1978-19, departs south with the water tower which supplied the station columns and the shed on the upside still prominent. The shed closed in August 1963. Pulthelly, at 271.5 miles from Paddington, is reached. 78-19 runs out light engine from the station to the shed, renewed as late as 1959. This brings us to the end of our look at the days of steam on the Cambrian coastline. The last steam board train from Aberystwyth was the evening mail, hauled by Standard Class 4, 75021 on March the 4th, 1967. While holidaying in the area, you would have often seen the Prince of Wales feathers insignia at various places like the Talachlin and the Festiniog coat of arms. The motto is Ich Dien, I serve. The steam engine should have had that motto. They served the Cambrian well. <laughs>